Okay, it's just gone 5 past 1 uh, p.m. here in South Africa. Um, I'm uh, Nicola Pallet, and thank you for joining us today for our report back uh, webinar. So I'm going to kick us off. We've waited five minutes uh, for folks to arrive, and folks will probably still be arriving uh, during the webinar. Uh, just a quick note uh, for anyone who's just uh, come online is that this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be shared via our YouTube channel. So just be um, conscious that anything you say or type into the text chat is being recorded. Um, yeah, so we've got a very exciting report back webinar planned for you for today about our wonderful adventure to Kansas City where we attended the Inter AACT International Convention. Um, in October, it took place between the 23rd and the 27th. Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, I'll kick us off. And I'm joined by uh, my colleague from the Emerge Africa team, Dr. Alice Fowler's on board. Hi, everybody. Hey. <laughs> So glad to have you here um, today, Alice. Thanks, Nicola. I'm holding thumbs for the windy weather. Oh, so you've got wind and we've, we've got rain this side. <laughs> well, the Cape Town, as I mentioned, we we're always very happy to have some rain. Okay, so back to AECT. So we had a very long flight from South Africa. Uh, to uh, we, we traveled via Heathrow uh, in London and then Chicago and then we finally arrived uh, in Kansas City so that's just a picture of sort of what it looks like a very promising picture and here's Alice and I showing where we are on the map and Kansas City is actually not in Kansas it is on the sort of edge of that, that, that between Kansas and Missouri, and I think it actually falls under Missouri. That I found quite interesting. Indeed, it's a very, very sleepy city, not, not at all like what we think of. Uh, you know, we always think most of our African cities are very, very, very busy with lots of people and activity and. The city is very quiet by comparison. Okay, so a little bit of info about the AACT convention. So this is a very, very big international conference. In the US, this is people's, this is the learning conference to go to. Um, a lot of people that I spoke to saw this as their main conference and then they would attend uh, something else. So AECT, I, I know I really I haven't mentioned this, it's, it stands for the Association for Educational Communications and Technology. And it's massive. There were over, uh, and every year, year it's about like this, over 500 concurrent sessions, or here folks perhaps you know, use the word parallel sessions, uh, 27 workshops. There was one sort of official keynote and then there were multiple presidential sessions. There were also panel discussions, posters, roundtables, receptions, sort of dinners you could go to, division and commit, committee meetings, and lots of informal opportunities to really to network and to connect. And the conference program was actually an entire book that you could buy, and I think that that says it all. Uh, there was This year there was even a conference app to assist with personal scheduling. Um, there was a lot of choice and really navigating the conference program really demanded close attention to detail and skill. I'm going to hand over to Alice next who's going to tell you a bit more about the divisions. Oh sorry about the theme. <laughs> 
Hi everybody. Um, the theme for this year was um, learning for all, um, learning from our peers and from various experts in the field, and with a very special focus on uh, underrepresented uh, groups. There was a real sense that um, the conference is an annual highlight for many of the people that were at the conference and is kind of like their main professional development and networking opportunity uh, during the year. I think that I've got a sense that just like we have this, those um, financial challenges of, of traveling and going to represent you know, our, our organization and ourselves at um, conferences, you get a sense that this is the same challenge that they have there. So a lot of conversations revolved around, well, I'm here now, and people were making plans for which conferences, which other conference they might be um, attending in the future. Um, there are a lot of people from a lot of places, not a lot of, of people from our continent, but there's a strong East Asian presence. And there are several affiliates of AMCT from, I think, Korea, China, Japan, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. As an organization, um, AECT consists of 11 divisions, um, which represent the, the breadth and the depth of the field. Oh, can I change? Sorry. Yes, the 11 divisions which represent the breadth and the depth of the field, and members of the AECT join the divisions that best suit their interests. So, for example, uh, emerges an affiliate is affiliated to the Division for Culture, Learning and Technology. And the purpose of CLT is to represent those members of the AECT who are interested in researching at the intersection of culture, learning and technology. And I think for us this is a good collaboration because um, here on the African continent I still feel we haven't engaged in up with issues around culture in relation to learning and teaching, and especially culture with regards to educational technology. Um, there's another um, division, for example, Emerging Learning Technologies, which serves to promote the production and utilization of the latest innovative technologies through the creation of a network of individuals. So there are all these different divisions that focus on various aspects of educational technology and educational technology use in learning and teaching. There's also a very strong focus on developing um, postgraduate students, and they have a graduate student assembly, which basically provides opportunities for postgraduates to engage in professional leadership roles and networking and developing the skills and resources uh, that they require for solving the problems that they're working with in their studies. Oh, and before I talk about this picture, I forgot to say that each of those divisions has like elected officers that run the division, and it's always very confusing when you talk to people and they'll tell you. Um, I'm the president-elect, or the president-elect designate, or a past president. They have all these different um, titles um, that reflect uh, people and the roles that they've played in the running of the, the divisions, whether it's now or, or in the past. And Nicola and I were having a little bit of a detail about that. Um, as you can see, Nicola and I uh, went out there to represent Emerge, and on our first day we pulled out our Emerge t-shirts, stood united, and went around um, basically um, marketing um, Emerge and representing it and making sure people knew we were there. Our goals and going actually were to reconnect with our CLT colleagues and to network with others and to learn and to strengthen developing links and to develop new ones. Uh, we also got to meet a lot of new people 
that we hadn't met before. Um, you need to know that this was my second time at AECT and Nicola's second time as well. So we got to meet some new people we hadn't met face to face, but we will be collaborating with on a research collaboration um, pilot that we'll talk about a little later on um, in the webinar. So we wore our t-shirts on that first day just to make us very visible and then got asked afterwards, why aren't you wearing them now? Okay, Nicola. Okay, so what, what did we go to do there? One of the things uh, by that being an affiliate um, allows us is that we get a chance to present something at the conference. So I was presenting about um, value creation stories uh, from our facilitating online course. Um, there was quite a bit of interest. I'm going to share um, my slides. Post that. that was the presentation at that stage. I've worked on it since then. I presented again on it at the Heku 9 conference last year. I mean, sorry, last week. Um, but it was it was interesting. Um, a lot of the sessions were really really good, but actually poorly attended because there were so there were just so many. Um, Jerome, I see you said with so many divisions and tracks, uh, participants miss out on some sessions. You miss out like you won't believe. Like there are say twenty things to choose from. There might be five things you really want to go to, and you can only pick one thing at that for that hour. Um, so it's really like one has to study the program really, really closely. Um, but I was, you know, I felt honoured that folks actually came to my my session um, and found it interesting. I also decolonised the space a bit and got folks to sit around in and sat around in a circle. One of um, the attendees actually lent me her laptop because there wasn't a laptop um, set up there. When, when I got there, um, yeah, which is something unusual because we, we always, I mean, a lot of conferences that I attend, uh, everything is set up for you. You just bring your flash or during the lunchtime, you know, back in your presentation. But I was presenting about uh, some evaluation research work uh, that we've been doing in the network uh, in relation to the course where we are using uh, Wenger, Wenger Trainer and Deloitte's uh, Value Creation Framework. And if you look at my slides, you can find out some more information about that. I'm not going to uh, talk too much about the presentation uh, in this webinar. Um, but other than presenting, we also went there to... Yeah, and, and Alice and Angela also had a session, was part of the CLT division where we've actually got an international research collaborative um, with the CLT division where we're working on a international research collaborative. Um, so Angela and uh, Alice uh, ran that session. And it was also informed, um, and it's informing for a participants about this newly established research collaboration um, where we're pilot that we're piloting between AUCT, uh, CLT and Emerge Africa. The aim is to develop a research community of practice to support educational technology um, researchers and practitioner researchers uh, to grow this community that's also interested in intersections of culture, learning and technology. I think, Alice, you want to talk more about this? Yeah, um, we basically introduced um, the project to the people that um, um, attended the session. We talked about it. We talked about um, how far we had gone. We realized that uh, it had to be an organic process. It's um, a group of people that that, that basically are participating and collaborating on research from the emerge side and from the CLT side 
who come from all over the world. So we were discussing things like how you pull the group together, how you deal with the fact that people are living on different continents and in different time zones and trying to get people with common interests um, on the same page and, and on the same channel at the same time. Um, it, was, it, was, it was quite challenging, but uh, it was also interesting talking about the different ways people have, the things that people are doing to kind of mitigate those challenges of, of, of distance and time, because those seem to be um, the biggest challenges. But right now we do have um, four sort of uh, groups that have been formed, that have all they all started, but they're in different stages, and some groups have been able to move faster than others. But each group is led by a pair of established scholars or mentors, uh, one each from CIT and Emerge, and we're on the move. So we'll just say, watch this space. And then Nicola and I went to this first kind of, it was like a general session with a keynote speaker, um, Dr. Jeffrey Biller, who spoke on, um, <laughs> on what it's like to be an introvert and to understand, to, to have a gain an understanding of what introverts are like and how um, one can work with them and how introverts can work with groups of people that contain introverts and, and extroverts. So it was um, called knowing yourself and collaborating with all kinds of people um, to get things done. And one of the activities that we did uh, during that talk was to try and determine what sort of introvert or extrovert that, that we were. And I discovered I'm definitely an introvert with, with some extrovert tendencies, and Nicola was a half and half. I didn't believe that, Nicola. I still think you are you're an extrovert. Yeah, Tony Flexivert. Anyway, he spoke about the fact that um, academic professions tend to attract introverts and that universities are actually full of them and how to recognize introverts and extroverts in the workplace. And he said that introversion is a matter of how people process information. It's not about shyness, and that all people fall on a spectrum. Um, you don't have congenital uh, introverts or extroverts. Everybody falls somewhere on that spectrum. Um, introverts tend to face leadership challenges um, because they're uncomfortable taking risks, and they tend not to enjoy social occasions, and I'll confirm that. But, it's really very true, and I am a very reluctant leader. Um, but he also went on to say that introverts can shift orientation uh, through learned extraversion to compensate for some of the challenges they face in leadership roles. So he basically went on to tell, you know, to, 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 to give suggestions about how introverts can, off, can operate efficiently and effectively and without getting overly stressed with groups of people um, that they're leading. Um, and he said that often introverts um, use temporary intentional and strategic elements um, from extroverts in order to function. But he did caution that um, one needs to be careful when adopting extroverted um, traits and he gave suggestions on how this was done. Um, Nicola, I don't think there was any mention of technology in that particular um, uh, discussion, but it was uh, interesting and quite well attended. Okay, then we attended a session on equity learning, the history, evolution, and influence in education design practices. And basically, um, the picture that you see shows um, a panel of, of, of people, their names uh, appear on the right hand side, who discuss the history and current practices related to equity learning and how it has evolved and influenced 
education design um, processes. And um, what became very clear is that many researchers are concerned with equity in learning, education, and design. And the reality, though, is that the field of educational design technology, whilst it's tried to address equity, it, it, its results are often mixed and they're often unintended um, results. And it was agreed that advancing equity requires an understanding of it and then embracing research-based practices to make change happen. So in that session, each of those six panelists basically gave a 60-second spiel on a particular issue um, around equity that was of interest to them. And then we had the opportunity to talk to them as individuals and also to have group discussions around the issues that have been raised. So, for example, Angela um, presented, um, has still talked about equality versus equity. I think you've all seen that that uh, picture on social media, the one which shows, which tries to, 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 to define or to describe the difference between equality versus equity and the, the people that are standing behind the fence that the barrier, with some people being able to see over the top and others not, and then um, the equity being shown, or the one being shown as people standing on boxes of various heights in order to, to look over the fence. But I think what was interesting, uh, as we discussed that issue, um, we came to the realization that in actual fact, what should happen is that the fence must come down, then there would be no barriers. Um, Amy talked about being civil, civility, um, and the fact that it's often unequally supplied. Uh, Rob Branch talked about um, do we have systems to deal with issues of equity? Um, um, I can't remember whether it was Albert or Andrew talked about the levels of the digital divide and that there are three main levels that tend to revolve around access, use, and creation. And that despite a lot of work being done around the digital divide, most research still targets looking at issues of, of equity with regards to access and not so much recent creation. And then there was um, uh, somebody talked about the design of everyday things and asked us to think about what comes to mind when we design technology interventions. It, it, was, it was an interesting and quite an intense session. We I mean, were supposed to go around the room and talk to different people, but I ended up just sitting at one table because it was really interesting. Um, Nicola, do you want to talk about the understanding and addressing social insurance barriers? Yeah, sure, Alice. So Amy um, Bradshaw presented this presidential session and I thought it was really interesting um, because it's something that uh, you know we have these kinds of conversations a lot uh, in the South African context um, and this was also very much around around equity and especially in, in the South African context around decolonizing the curriculum so I could really uh, relate to her, uh, her session and I was surprised by how few people, or in a presidential session, um, how few people attended. It could possibly, I think, have been the kind of deeper social focus uh, that not all are um, aware of. But I just thought this is definitely an area where there could be a lot of um, sort of uh, <clears throat> more, more discussion. I think we've definitely we've identified a key um, theme where there's, there's a common interest. Um, yeah, I think that's all I'll say, Alice. Um, I, Nicole, I don't remember if you attended this, but I went to uh, a discussion which revolved around addressing culture in EdTech scholarship and practice. It was 
a really interesting um, um, session. It consisted of a panel of basically the leading reformist voices in in the ed tech space and the equality sort of in, in yeah in that space. And they basically discussed the issue of how to effectively address culture in the context of scholarship and practice. And some of the things that came up are what you see on the screen. I think what came out very loudly and very clearly is that if you're going to start to address issues of culture in that in in, in, in one's scholarship and in one's practice, uh, a lot of self reflection and interrogation and questioning of oneself and one's motives um, is is needed. The other thing that came up was that we tend to look at things in little bits and silos and fragment things. And um, uh, it, it was felt that um, ed educational technology and that space tends to do this and that there's a need to look at this issue from a point of, of wholeness and, and integrity and that all the teaching and learning we do needs to be grounded in social justice and ethics and in philosophy in order to achieve um, socially just um, ed tech use. So people that are involved in designing um, uh, materials and apps and all sorts of things they need to engage in intention, they need to engage in interaction and introspection to open themselves up to new perspectives. So this requires uh, mind shifts and looking at things differently and in a sensitive fashion at all times. Um, it was suggested that one of the ways in which this could be done was to, to interact with learners and use learner analysis Often as designers, we, we, we just go away and develop things without um, sort of having the voice and, and, and of, of our learners in it. So it was felt that there was a need to use learner analysis to help think about these issues. And that there were two things that were flagged. Is that we do talk a lot about people being marginalized and, and, and so on, but people are not marginalized in all situations. And the other important thing that was brought up is that efforts um, to kind of introduce culture into edtech get caught up in the global agenda. And the, the one person said, we must stop being imperialist in our country. Okay. Yeah, so there was a lovely event, uh, one that I, oh, oh, I enjoyed the first time I attended the convention and I made sure that I got to it again. It was the Breakfast with the Champions. Um, so the first time I went, I sat with David Wiley and I think also uh, George Valenciano, I can't remember. Um, but this year I went and sat with... Um, Mark uh, Childress and sorry, Marcus Childress. He is. Where is it, Mark? Sorry, I could be. I want to get it right. <laughs> um, and he'd written about um, you know the early stuff, way back on uh, you know Second Life and you know online games and is now much more prominent in the sort of leadership space. Um, I think his name is actually not on this list. I, I kind of copied from the, the program that I found there that I found online. Okay, but I'll come back to it. But he's very much involved now with uh, sort of leadership not just within AECT but also within the university space uh, and you know folks were asking basically you can sit down with a champion uh, and you can talk about different kinds of issues and ask the person for advice or have a you know ask a question 
and the other uh, and then I also sat with Patricia Young who is one of my mentors uh, for the research group that, that I'm part of so as part of those uh, the initiative that we mentioned earlier that we're piloting there are also um, different groups and together with Camille who's attending uh, today um, Patricia Young is one of the, the mentor for the instructional design group. Um, that was re really, really nice, being able to uh, meet her face to face. Uh, she's also, she w was one of the folks, she will, will I'd say, has written a lot about sort of culture-based uh, learning design framework. Um, that's, I think, one of her big contributions. All right, and then I also try to, like, I was interested in attending sessions with useful resources. So I attended one about accessible online learning where they analyzed a whole different bunch of online quality assurance frameworks uh, that are popular in the U.S. I'll share a link to that. And what's really interesting is not only, you know, when people take a course online or start teaching, um, they actually have to get this quality matters um, and that's the most prominent, uh, most widely, widely used quality assurance framework there. They've actually got to get that uh, course quality assured and has to, um, has to con con uh, meet a whole bunch of criteria. Um, yeah, I'd actually never heard, because I realized how little quality assurance we're doing in the South African context. I'd never heard of most of the quality assurance frameworks that our US colleagues are mentioning. Um, this particular presentation was by Patrick Lowenthal from Boys State University and Amy Lomellini. Uh, she's from Malloy College. Um, yeah, so they, they did this popular uh, this analysis of popular online quality assurance frameworks and what the, they particularly looked at um, the standards they're based on and honed in on accessibility. And they also discussed the implications of the results uh, with the audience and what this means for research and practice of online learning. Um, for them, they argued that accessibility is a hot topic in online education but despite the increased uh, focus to most discussions uh, about this, you know, and accessible uh, online courses actually focus on compliance. So they were they were problematizing that. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in accessibility, it's really worth looking at um, the framework that they discuss. I thought the OS. CQR was really nice. I'm going to share links. Uh, and there they have all a whole bunch of uh, criteria that is linked to, um, yeah, it each has its own web page. And you can find out more about that particular uh, standard. I thought that was nice. Um, the Gagne workshop was, I thought, it, it was very, very interactive. It was by. Um, Gura Preet uh, Khalsa from University of South Alabama and Sylvia Elaine Rogers from Auburn University. So they went through the, you know, each principle uh, of instruction and then asked folks to pair up and ask, well, what might this involve in a blended or online teaching space? Um, yeah, so I thought it was, it was a very interactive exploration of how to reconceive of Ganya's nine events. Um, yeah, and I, I really, really enjoyed it, and particularly the dialogue um, with someone, um, you know, just chatting to someone new was a nice networking opportunity. And I also attended a uh, next you know, there, there were a lot of, I also want to highlight, there were a lot of presentations with the word diversity in it some way. Um, so even though, you know, there seemed to not be as much interest in equity, the word, you know, diverse, the notion of diversity was very attractive. 
So I attended a session on the next generation of instructional designers by um, Jason McDonald, Patricia uh, Slachter from Chiron, uh, Tusi Rumi, and Patricia Young, who joined uh, virtually. And they shared a, uh, their experience of a project where they are engaged in instructional design students in diversity issues and why it's important for instructional designers to have this awareness. I just thought, you know, we've got to get this into our program somehow. I felt a bit, you know, guilty that we're not even, you know, we're not teaching this explicitly perhaps enough as what, uh, you know, they had it as more as an activity. Um, but I thought that this is an area which, you know, people teaching um, these kinds of courses, um, you know, could, could, could get some ideas from these uh, instructional design lecturers. So they looked at sort of not also discuss also discuss some of the challenges um, and approaches uh, that they use that they used and faced, and they all and invited people to share what they were doing uh, themselves. Okay. Um, Another presentation I really enjoyed, uh, given my current interest in evaluation, was by Howard Coleman of Ithaca College, who presented about the link between confirmative evaluation and needs assessment, reflections from a case study. So that's in an evaluation journal. Um, I'll share the title. You can always uh, look it up if you want to. Um, that, well, that was particularly um, I mean, even though a few people attended, it was really, really, we had a really good discussion, uh, I think, as well at the end of his presentation. So he described a case study um, of integrated program evaluation and the needs assessment processes. And how you sort of uh, looked at the evaluation of the course that served to drive and organizational change initiative. Um, yeah, and he basically discovered a whole bunch of factors that were actually outside the scope of instruction, but that affected the success of the course as well as the broader change initiative. And Camille, who is uh, has joined us today, um, she co-presented uh, with Leroy Hill, uh, I think it's Hill, virtually. Um, he was presenting on the value in diverse online program in the Caribbean. Yeah, Leroy Hill. And they, I thought what was really the abstract for their chapter I actually found online. Um, um, folks want to have a look at it for interest or in your own time. You don't have to look at it now, you can always just open the link. Um, but they presented a conceptual framework uh, about the how students participated in an online instructional design program and the students were um, from the Caribbean and they had um, socio-cultural influencing uh, factors. Um, sorry, what I found, I'll actually just focus on, I think, what was new to me, which was Almore's work. Um, so sort of Almore's framework, uh, stuff about, around uh, leadership. And I just found the, generally the framework that they were using and how they uh, combined the work of, you know, Almore's mode of leadership, Bordeaux's, uh, Bourdieu's habitus, and Hofstede's cultural dimensions uh, theory. I liked how they combined it um, to form this framework to look at the complexities of how students, you know, in different parts of the Caribbean uh, interacted in this diverse um, online environment. Um, yeah, I'm probably not doing justice to it, Camille. So please, please forgive me. 
folks can yeah, please feel free to type and elaborate. And okay, so I will I will just copy what from my notes here. Um, I've actually got got the abstract. But my, my main point is that, because um, I think in a lot of uh, research in or educational technology research in African context, we don't um, pay enough attention to the sophistication um, of theoretical frameworks um, and, how, and, and to use that to um, sort of argue for particular things that we might be seen uh, and to sort of you know base our research on. I think they've really provided a good example of that. Okay, and then I turned it. Um, it's another one that I turned it by Yu Chang. And it was on um, the community of inquiry model, not just looking at it from a. Um, it was interesting. It was it was from. It's also from a more student um, perspective. Um, actually, blanked out a little bit. Let me go back. Tweets it about mine. Deep I had a very deep reflection that I now cannot remember. How terrible is that? But I think while I'm having that little moment, I'm going to hand over to Alice. Right. Um, I went to a presentation. Um, as you can see, most of the things that I'm presenting on have got to do with, like, faculty professional development because um, that is an area of interest for me, not only in the work that I do with Emerge, but in, 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 in my other workspace. So professional development is a key word for me. I attended this uh, particular presentation that was presented by uh, uh, two people, one from Radford University, you can forgive me for not remembering their names, and which is a, a small university that has approximately kind of like 9,000 students, and then Virginia Tech, which is a much, much uh, larger institution that has uh, over 20,000 students. And they were tackling the issue of, 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 of professional development, um, um, which is, uh, I think, a problem in, in, <laughs> in many institutions and very much so in, in, in the higher education space. And um, given that they had these um, two university communities that kind of vary in size and vary in, in sort of in, in function and geographical location and so on and so forth, they were looking at working collaboratively together to come up with some sort of uh, professional uh, development um, framework that on which they could hang their their interventions that they were trying with their uh, staff members. So they were telling us a little bit about their project, which had only sort of uh, hadn't really taken off; it just started. And so, for example, at Radford, they they um, decided to approach professional development and professional development activities through having staff conferences which were held um, between um, semesters. Virginia Tech, which is a much larger uh, organization, which um, we were also told is very fragmented and siloed, what they did was they initially just started a, a networked professional development advisory group that comes together on a regular basis to have sessions on what staff need and to share information with intentions of then um, implementing um, interventions at some point. Um, in this initial early journey of theirs to try and, and come up with 
some sort of a format for professional development for their institutions. They did realize, though, that um, for it to have impact, um, one needed to take into, into consideration organizational priorities and also to not just do interventions with staff and leave it there, but to actually track individual uh, performance against um, an annual plan for each individual. And then, of course, as we know, to sustain um, motivation. <clears throat> Nicola. Yes, and I'm glad Mohammed is attending because I really, really thought of you a lot when, when I was attending this uh, presentation by uh, Ahmed uh, Lacheb. I uh, hope I'm saying your name right if you are happening to be listening. But he's from um, Tunisia and he looked at uh, sort of instructional design and technology training in the Tunisian um, higher education context. Um, you know, what, what are very much more like, I think I remember it being a sort of design-based research study, which is so why I thought of the moment. Um, and what, what, you know, when when they taught instructional designers, what was it that they needed to be able to do? Uh, one of the things was to be able to define what is instructional design and do a needs analysis. Um, writing learning objectives. And I know this is something that lecturers do find uh, really objectives and learning outcomes that is something that people do find quite ch challenging. Um, looking at different sort of schools of learning what we call, or learning theories and also understanding the purpose of learning, uh, writing, uh, you know, learning, uh, sort of learning outcomes and then sort of instructional strategies that, that would match those uh, by and how these are informed by different learning theories. That was the, what they do the content of the training. Um, so in one aspect, I found the content of, you know, what they were, um, the, the what of the training interesting, but there's also the broader story of the how of, um, of the training. Um, and it's equally interesting within that particular context. So Ahmed is from the University of Indiana, University School of Education. And they looked, he was working also with colleagues. I can't remember, I don't have his colleagues' the names with me right now, but they were describing this quite unique uh, training that took place in Tunisia. And they were also evalu evaluating the overall sort of worthiness and outcomes of the training. Um, I think. Alex, perhaps this one, unless you want me to do the next one, which is also sort of instructional design. But it's fine. You can you can do it. I can add to it if you like. Yeah. So this one, I was very, it was very interesting because it was packed compared to a lot of the other sessions, um, and it was a session on the professional development of instructional designers. Um, there was a lot around, you know, instructional designers. They felt that they are isolated at the institutions and they really want to be part of a community of practice with more active sharing of resources and experiences. Um, I also shared a, it was a short while after this, an article uh, came out. It was a, you know, general, I think, university world, no, inside higher ed piece. Um, about how at American universities people were saying that, um, or instructional designers, that their colleagues and, and other faculties didn't know what instructional design is or what they did. Uh, and they felt that they were sort of isolated. So that sort of resonated with, with, uh, with attending this, uh, this session. Um, yeah, so they also were saying they feel that higher education doesn't know what instructional designers are and that they often go unrecognized, uh, unrewarded with a lack of opportunities for professional development. Um, some of them also perhaps want to do something, but are, uh, you know, part of their job 
you know, particular role might be professional um, rather than academic. So it was interesting to hear some of the, the tensions um, and also that instructional design doesn't mean the same thing across the universities. A lot of people I spoke of all, you know, do different kinds of work. And 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 how they define it is, is very different. Uh, Alice, would you like to add? Well, um, it was it was quite intense, and um, you could really feel that people were struggling and wanting to have a sort of more clearly defined identity. They kind of felt like their status was a little bit ambiguous and amorphous. Um, but they wanted ways to use their skills to help others. In other words, they wanted engagement in what they felt was meaningful work. Um, they wanted to to be able to, to have um, setups where they could collaborate and participate in research opportunities. And they wanted mentoring and situations that would encourage knowledge sharing across disciplines because often um, um, some of these instructional designers are, 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 are working with, with with particular schools or particular disciplines where they did their, um, their work but they all were kind of feeling like really um, isolated and not recognized um, and that was really powerful for me to realize that it just suddenly came to me like wow We've got identity issues here. Um, and then Wakanda was on the program. I don't know how many of you have watched um, the Black Panther movie, but um, uh, Joy Moore, who's a Nigerian um, scholar award winner, presented on. Um, the Black Panther effect and uh, sort of unpacked the whole um, Black Panther movie um, and, and looked at it within the context of, 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 of children or students of color and them identifying with the characters that were in the movie, the majority of whom were, were people of color. I think there were only like two people of not of color in, 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 in that movie. But she basically um, unpacked it. She showed um, us some video clips of kids being interviewed about what they thought. Young kids, like eight, seven, eight, nine year olds, about what they thought about um, all the different characters in, in in the movie and who they identified with and why they identified with them and what they thought of the movie it was it was really quite um, entertaining and then she 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 basically um, came up with this idea that the representation in media uh, can create engage in formal and informal learning opportunities and presented um, sort of a case study of a school that had kind of embraced the whole uh, Black Panther idea and started to organize a whole lot of learning activities that the kids in those schools got involved in that were linked to the whole uh, idea of the culture that is reflected um, in the movie. And was, she was basically saying that people of color, especially youth, are able to identify closely with actors who look like them as positive role models in culturally rich settings. And if you did watch Wakanda, I mean, Wakanda is a bit, uh, sorry, I keep calling it Wakanda. Um, the Black Panther is like really over the top in terms of culture that was in the movie and in terms of the technology. And these kids were relating very, very strongly to it. So she unpacked this whole thing uh, using Bandura's social learning theory. Really, very interesting. Okay, so here are just some of our reflections. Um, 
for me, it was interesting. I kind of like, I must admit, <laughs> I assumed that there would be tech set up in venues and sometimes the wireless was not accessible. Um, so it wasn't accessible in, in most of those uh, venues that I attended. And I guess we have a lot of expectations when it comes to a, a conference just was based in the US and, you know, is an air tech conference. But on the plus side, um, the lack of technology, I think, really, it also helped us to con 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 it helped us to connect with each other. Um, so, the human side. Um, yeah, and I thought, you know, people who attended my session, they commented that they liked, you know, sitting in a circle for a change. And I think it shows that there is potential for some venues to maybe be less formal. Um, yeah, as I, I did mention, I think there were too many parallel sessions. Uh, and with the result that the spread was, the spread of the sessions were fully attended. Yeah, and Alice, you want to share yours? Yeah, so um, there was lots on offer. It was like going to a buffet, a really big one, but not everything was in the same place. So you had, it would be like going to a buffet where everything is set up like on 50 tables. And you've got to rush between between uh, the, the tables. Lots of interesting things were available, but just in too many different places. So what happened? What I felt was that I ended up snacking. I, I ended up picking and choosing uh, where I would go, where I would go, and sometimes a lot of it was based on how quickly I could go from one day to another. So I kind of felt like there were things that I could attend, could have attended, but because of, of, of the fact that there were so many things going on at the same time in so many different venues, um, you just missed out on some of, of the things. And then, this was my second uh, convention. So, like I said, I had a, a, a better sense of what um, to expect. And I got to meet up with um, people that I'd met the previous time and reconnect and try to establish our relationships. And I think um, the highlight for me was actually meeting face to face some of the new people that we're going to start working with on our research uh, collaboration and um, getting to chat with them. And I also went and attended a CLT division meeting that was um, facilitated by Akisha Horton, who is uh, basically heading that division. And it was just really interesting to sit in and hear about what the division is doing, the sort of awards um, that are available, that have been won, um, to learn about their research support and, and activities, um, also, some of the, the publisher stuff, that the publication stuff they're getting involved in, like the Tech Trends Special Issue um, and, and various book uh, proposals. What was also of interest for me was to learn about what they call the MIM Oral uh, History Project, which is being, I think, led by Deepak, which is MIM represents or stands for uh, minorities in. in in media, and they have this oral history project that they that they are um, uh, sort of looking at as one of their projects in that uh, particular division. And I also learned about the the virtual community, which uses um, Google Suites. You can see the, the link to it there. So it was really interesting to just sit in on that meeting and hear what they're doing and and the direction they're going, and, and some of the opportunities that they are to get involved, for example, in, in, in participating in, in writing publications, book chapters, and so on, and putting together proposals for books. Yeah. Nicola? Yeah, I just, uh, Irene's asking, yeah, how did your presentation go? Um, yeah, I think it went great. Um, uh, there were, there, as I mentioned, few people, but fewer people actually meant that you could have deeper conversations, uh, which is quite, quite nice. Um, 
and you know, feel more connected. There wasn't much on evaluation, so I think I did um, help fill a gap uh, in that way. And particularly, most folks had never heard of the, va uh, the value creation framework. And they were also interested in, you know, this online and online course in African context. You know, I think that was also something that made it uh, exotic um, in some way, perhaps. Uh, for my, my highlight, uh, other than presenting and sharing something new, was also seeing our uh, US-based colleagues face-to-face uh, -face and folks from other parts. Uh, not everyone was from the US. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration, knowledge exchange, and further conversation, uh, especially around uh, equity, uh, also around you know, learning design. And now for the fun part. Um, we also had had, um, this was from the, at the last day of the conference, and Alice didn't come with for this one. Um, but it, we had a, it was a dinner. And this is called uh, the university's reception. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to cough quickly. But, um, and what happens at a university's reception is that all the universities uh, who teach instructional design um, and education, they have exhibitions and all around this huge hall and they bring their banners and they all have things to give away and little brochures and they're basically sort of competing for uh, students so unlike our context where there are very few people teaching uh, instructional design um, there it's like it's it's huge um, so it's, it's actually uh, universities are well they you sense everything's very collegial, uh, there's also a lot of competition. So, here's a pick of it. It's Tutelani, who helped get us there and organize things. Uh, him and Tonya say they're on the, um, the bottom right, and they were kind of, you know, partly responsible for how Emerge Africa became um, affiliated uh, with AECT, because they said, well, why do we have nobody here from from Africa? Uh, and the, their conversation, I mean, it was when they were graduate students, I think, you know, that was their their project. Is they wanted to see, you know, what could we do to get more, uh, more make the conference more, this international convention, sorry, more inclusive. And here yeah, with the Wildcats is uh, Justine, International Division, um, Bottom, uh, Amy, who I mentioned, and also um, George Valencianos, some other folks here, or Peggy Lumpkin, and Denise. Here is our famous Alice and Angela. And I also got to meet face to face with someone I've been chatting to for quite a while, which is Rebecca. Um, so we just also, as an aside, had some really interesting news because we had we both got chapters in a book um, that is coming out soon. And I hadn't met her. I just said, oh, well, there's this other person writing about games in Africa. I said to this editor, maybe, maybe you, must, you must contact her. Um, so we've sort of been scheming together for a while, Rebecca and I. And this one at the bottom is, I think when, wasn't that the day we arrived? I think that was our, yes, that was the first day. Um, and the next convention is going to be back in uh, Las Vegas. And the same place it was the first year I went. Um, yeah. So watch out for their call for proposals. And I'm going to also hand over, I think, to, to Alice. You want to take us through some more fun slides?
Yeah, um, there weren't too many places um, to go, but uh, we worked out that there was um, um, a market, um, like about three trolley bus stops from where we were staying. So we ventured out there on the Saturday, and since it was just before Halloween, there were pumpkins absolutely everywhere we looked. So that's us sitting in our own pumpkin patch and having a photo. Um, yeah, pumpkins, pumpkins, pumpkins. And witches too. And then, um, it's very possible um, if you are an um, Emerge African member to become an AECT member, there's a, a discount for Emerge Africa members and some of the benefits that you get from joining AECT, which we're encouraging people to join up, um, is access to journals, um, downloadable books, um, reference guides, and can can also sign up with divisions other than uh, CLT. You can get their newsletters and, and respond to calls for papers, etc. So if you're interested, um, you can um, contact us and we'll help hook you up so that you can become an ACT member. Nicola, do you want to add to that? Yes, there's just one thing. The folks may have seen those red uh, Springer books. So they're usually like super expensive. But if you are a member of, and I think it's like $30 um, for a year's membership, you get access to all those books for free. So usually, you know, one can't even afford one of those books um, in, you know, buying one printed book for that price. I really I encourage you to become an Emerge Africa member. Oh yeah, and then, well, there's also access to an extensive reference uh, library for AEC team members. So we just encourage you to become an Image Africa member so that you can become an AECT member and access those resources and, and opportunities. Yeah, sorry, so Alice, I'm just going to jump in there because I saw yeah. Jerome's asking membership. So on the Image Africa website, I'm just going there now, on the side you'll see affiliate, uh, AECT, become an AECT member. Uh, and there's a link to our affiliation uh, agreement, I think. Um, so you get access to UC, uh, AACT online journals, books, and other resources. You can vote in AACT elections. Um, you get no cost access to, yeah, so being part of the divisions actually doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't cost you anything extra. Um, and you have the opportunity to pay the, an international rate to register for the AECT uh, convention, which is what we were speaking about now. Um, I'm just checking. I think it was $30. I'm just trying yeah. to see what... But basically, anyone who is part of Emerge Africa uh, can, is eligible for this discount. Just, I'm, could, I'm, I hope I'm not talking nonsense, but I'm pretty sure it was 30 I um, think it is 30 Oh, yes, yes, yeah. Uh, Emerge Africa members can join ACT with affiliate agreement for discounted price of $30 and 15 for students. And um, the page I was looking at is this one here. It's on the Emerge Africa website. And this is just one of the things, you know, I thought I'd just show you the reference library, which links the reference library, ETR and D, um, so it's one of their journals. It is also, um, I discovered, well, it, it is one of the publications that our university, well, UCT actually recognizes as a peer-reviewed publication, and they're quite 
fussy about what is on, you know, various international, you know, citation indexes and whatnot. Um, but they recognize that one. Um, and there's this growing um, handbook. And there's a lot of, you know, ACT books and different series. They've also got um, video library. Um, <laughs> and... Yeah, so you can click on these things, but you won't be able to sort of access the book or the, you know, go through quite far because those are for, uh, you know, you need a member login. But you can still explore um, on the AACT uh, website. Interested. And also just wanted to remind folks is that if you're interested in cultural learning and technology, um, we had this webinar series a while back sharing the link um, and it's fascinating how uh, things have developed uh, since then um, yeah and then just for anyone who may be new hasn't heard about the merge yet there are some details So we're a free professional development network um, and our online events are open you know, while our main sort of uh, majority of our members are from African countries who are very open to anybody joining us. We're you know, a project hosted at uh, UCT but funded and funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. So yeah, I encourage you to Stay in touch with us via any of these channels and hope we can unleash the power of networks together even further. Sorry, I, I know we have gone over time. <laughs> we usually try to make them short, but today was just we just had so much to share. Um, yeah, are there any questions? Camille, I know you're you're joining us all the way from Australia, so thank you. Yeah, folks are typing. Alice, is there anything you want else that you wanted to say while folks are typing? No, um, it, it kind of was nice reflecting again and, and, and on on the experience and um, and having the opportunity to share it. And I'm also pleased that I've, I've actually managed to stay right to the end because usually the weather here uh, kicks me off the system. So. Thanks, everybody. Great, nice to meet you, Nanette. So, Nanette is uh, Neil's mentee in uh, the real world or um, as part of their research, or well, not that the research group or what call it, collaboration is not real. <laughs> um, Yeah, that was a pretty much our aim. We wanted to bring bring lots back that we would um, be able to share. And and I also we focus on things we know will a lot of folks are interested aren't interested in. Gabriel, I know you're also interested in quality assurance stuff and evaluation. Mohammed's also very interested in instructional design and. So Nanette also, instructional design. And thank you all for taking the time off today to join us.
and hopefully in the future we see some more uh, representation from the African continent at uh, the AACT convention. I think it is really, you know, well worth it. Uh, from what I remember, just for interest, it's that the Westgate casinos, considering the number, the amount of time one spends there, was not uh, excessively more than one would pay at uh, a local hotel. Yeah. Um, they actually make it, the accommodation, really, really affordable because they want people in the U.S. to go there to gamble. They want people to actually spend the money. <laughs> on the gambling. Um, so that just, you know, don't be uh, put off uh, by where it is. I found that well, that was in 2016. It was actually quite reasonable. All right. Uh, we'll answer any more questions in the text chat. And... We'll say goodbye to, uh, for now and wish you all a great day further.